college and did sports um, as a young guy. Didn't really know what direction I wanted to go in. Uh, I was actually back then as well in college. I was more into rugby, uh, rugby league in particular, um, and sort of playing at a semi-professional academy level uh, into my rugby league. And, and then um, sort of things like that filtered off. And I didn't quite go to university because uh, at that time I wasn't interested. I didn't really want to go to university. So I ended up working some all sorts of different little jobs. Um, and then it all came about a bit strange. Basically what had happened is my family had uh, moved to Kuwait. They got work opportunities in the Middle East. Um, and my dad was like, look, there's not much happening career-wise for you at the moment in the UK. Yeah. Uh, why don't you move to, move to Kuwait? We'll see if we can get you a, a, a little gig somewhere part-time. Um, and then instead of getting sports qualifications, get some qualifications outside of sport to give you a safety net. If sport doesn't work, I was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> and I was looking through um, an e-magazine um, that they used to email out. And I saw that Everton had an, uh, an academy there. So um, looking for players. So I thought, why not just spare it a moment, just send them one. You know, I know they're looking for players, but it's always worth asking a question. Yeah. Um, so I sent them just a question, look, do you need any coaches? I can, I can just come and help out and whatnot. And, you know, said I'm on the holiday for two weeks in the country. You know, can I come and volunteer? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the bosses there, Mike and Baker, were brilliant. They were like, yeah, come volunteer. We'd love to see you. You know, um, I did two weeks volunteering and they said, look, you haven't got your level one badge. So, or your level two badge. So we can't make you a head coach, but we can make you an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. You can come and help out because you've got college qualifications. You can come and just be an assistant. And, and I was like, well, this is perfect for me because I can work part-time as an assistant and do the studies to keep the family happy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I did. And that's how I ended up getting into it. I just started off as uh, an assistant for them doing some part-time hours. Um, and then, you know, Mike and Baker again was just amazing. They were always pushing you, you know, Con, you need to learn this, you need to learn that, why don't you get on this course, get on that course, and it was them who encouraged me to get my level one, before I know it, I've done my level two, and heading up the teams then, and, and grew there, and I was there for five years, so the start of my journey was over at Everton. Wow, so, then, so taking a punt on like, I'm not sure if I'm ready for this, or if I'm really qualified, or I'm not sure, you went for it, and then it turned into a five-year thing, I mean, how great is that, that actually, You've got to take that punt sometimes and like even if you think you're not ready well you just don't know that and like you know you might have gone for a role here but as you said they go well, actually go an assistant once you're in you can then work work your way up whether it's getting more qualifications or actually just the, the time on the grass right yeah yeah that's it exactly it was it was all and it just made me laugh now because obviously i went and got these other qualifications <laughs> as, a, as a safety net in case sport didn't work out and that ended up turning into a full-time work and now it's my career so and like you said it was just a punt it was just a little advert in a magazine that i was like oh i'd rather work part-time as a you know a helper around or a football club uh, and they, they sort of saw me in those two weeks and said oh why don't you be an assistant? And they, they were brilliant because, again, they put me at different age groups. It's like, why don't you be an assistant? I think originally with the under eights yeah. and the under 19s. That way there was like, you get to see a spectrum yes. of the academy. And like you say, they then obviously sometimes it's not just uh, you and what you think. Sometimes somebody sees something in you and they must have they must have seen something in myself in the work I was doing and yeah. encouraged me to get my badges. And before I know it, you know, I ended up like head of the under 12s. Wow. And then after um, about a year or two, because I'd been assistant for two years to the under-19s and the coach left, it was like, well, guys, we, we're going to give it to you. You've been around the guys for two years. You know them. You're doing a good job. So I ended up with the under-19s um, just from being there and working off a little advert. It was amazing, yeah. yeah. And like even like being a, a coach, you have to kind of be very adaptable. So when you're coaching under-8s and coaching under-19s, it's a completely different experience, whether you're coaching or players. And so for you to get that for that, that period of time, I suppose as you go through your coaching career, you kind of go, actually, I really enjoy the junior game or I really enjoy the youth game. Or, and you, you kind of maybe then can carve yourself out a bit of a, a coaching pathway into those age groups or, I mean, you know, whether it's elite level or community level and you can kind of start finding your feet, I suppose. Did you, did you kind of get a feeling of that at that time or were you kind of just spreading your wings to just to experience everything and then you kind of like landed to where you are coming up to kind of you know recent times yeah yeah I would say that um I, I was everywhere um in my first sort of two to three years journey with Everton it was 
um, yeah, I, I was just getting as many age groups in as I, as I possibly could. And then, like you say, you, you start to sort of, you're not meant to have favourites, but let's be honest, you start to get a bit of favouritism towards yeah. one rather than the other. And mm-hmm. um, I just found that um, I absolutely adored the under-19s. Uh, I loved working with that older age group. And to be fair to the academy, they just kept me there with them because they knew I loved them. Uh, and then I sort of bounced around ages because, you know, we'd sort of, I'd be with the under-12s, it'd be going really well. Um, we'd maybe have a problem with another side where, where they've not been so happy with something. So then Mike would say, next season, can you go and take, you know, the under 10, sorry for moving you, you know. Um, so I found then over that five years that I was solid to the 19s, but bounced around quite a few of the younger ages, which obviously sometimes you'd be like, oh, another new team, you know. But then looking back on that, um, I was actually thankful for that. Um, because it just gave me so much more um, experience and detailed experience and made me more versatile with different ages, you know. So it, it actually became vital to my coaching. Um, it really did. So I, was, I was grateful and it gave you good experience in terms of always taking on a new team, you yeah. know, keeping things fresh because that's, that's really challenging. You, you can get comfortable quite quick and easy with one side. Yes. You know, before you know it, you spent three, four years with this side and, yeah. you know, um, you only know how to work with that one age group. So actually bouncing around was brilliant for me and just getting that oh I've got to learn to adapt to a new group of people again so mm. that was great and having like the the brand Everton behind you I mean Everton you know one of the biggest teams in England um, I, I'm unsure how big they are around Europe or even the Middle East but to have that kind of resource the mentorship you know everything else behind you that must have also helped I wonder with maybe quality of players or, or just you learning as a coach from other coaches within the, the fraternity of, of, of Everton. Did you, have you found that like going, going up the, the time after Everton, that's kind of given you a really good foundation of how things should be or, or, or could be, you know, rather than kind of s- some coaches start in like the community and they kind of, they kind of work their way up, but it seems like you've got such a strong foundation of a really good network. So then when you, did move on and have moved on you can actually relate back to those times and go actually we did it this way or actually it's such a good way that you can actually follow on and, and put your own spin on it yeah massively 100 percent correct um that's exactly what it was um you know the education that you received there was was amazing and, and it was wonderful because it wasn't just everton they were just so open to other things um they brought in celtic um which for me was wonderful. Um, Celtic was my boyhood club. Uh, oh. my, my family, so, uh, my yeah. mum's side of the family is all Scottish. So, you know, I was like a kid in a sweet shop. I was just stood there with my mouth open looking at these coaches like, oh my God, you know. Uh, so Celtic flew over to, to the Middle East and they come and gave us an education. And we even flew over there to do a um, coaches convention that Celtic do um, each year. Um, and it's basically full access to the club. You know, we, we got to meet the chairman. We got to meet Peter Lowell at the club. Um, you know, right the way through, first team manager, and then we got to meet all the academy coaches, the international coaches, the guys that fly around the world. So, you you know, we got to watch from under eights all the way through, which was just incredible to get that experience as a, as a foundation, as a new coach. You know, like you say, a lot of guys um, start off in the community, and I've always felt I've missed that, um, you know, because it's, it's great to give back to your community. And I think those guys who do that job are just incredible. Mm. You know, they're giving up their weekends and their free time to mm. go and do that. I think that's where you learn a lot of real coaching. And I always felt I missed on that. However, I did get that great foundation because of the, the companies that you were working with. So it really did springboard me onto the next switch. When I then moved to Kuala Lumpur, um, after about a year, I was appointed technical director. Um, and that was purely because of that foundation from um, working with Everton and Celtic because you've mm-hmm. learned their ideas and their philosophies and then you could put your spin on it that suited the environment you was in kind of thing. So, um, yeah, massive foundation that, that's helped me no end. And when you see a name like that on a CV uh, and a location like that, people, are, you know, people straight away get interested. Like yeah. Everton, Kuwait, I want to, you know, might not necessarily be interested in playing myself, but they just want to come and have a chat just because they see <laughs> that, something different. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And I think you're right. I mean, having having that foundation, um, experience that thing, and when you move, you move to Kuala Lumpur. I mean, the, the culture, because you've done well, you've, you've moved countries into not even countries, regions, you know, continents to go and, and and play the same game of football. You know, football is in a in a way it's a simple game, but then culture has such a massive part to play. 
whether it's you're representing a, um, a city uh, or representing a country. And so did you find like going from like Kuwait under the proviso of the Everton and Celtics into Kuala Lumpur, even though you could bring in so much great expertise, you kind of had to start again a little bit because you had to understand how does the country of Malaysia play football? What is the, um, what's that culture around um, the sport? Um, how does other bits of the, um, not, not of the game, like political stuff or anything else actually comes into play? Yeah. Like, how did you find then going, right, I, I understand, I'm, I, know to, I need to know what I need to know, but actually I need to learn this whole other stuff before I ever even get stuck into it. Like, how did you find that? Yeah, that was uh, that was one of the, obviously the most challenging parts, to be honest. Um, learning to adapt that because, and especially at, at that time, I was I was a young guy. You know, I mean, I'd, uh, I started at um, Everton when I was only about 22, 23. Um, and then obviously five years later, I've then gone to um, Kuala Lumpur. So I'm still very, you know, you've got that young mind. You haven't got, you're not quite matured enough yet, you know. And so you turn up blue-eyed, bushy-tailed thinking, I've been to Everton and I've learned this from yeah. Celtic. Like, you just apply the same thing, yep. you know, and off you yep. go. It's, it's easy. You just, it's, it's from them, you know. You just plunk it in and it's done and it's good. <laughs> and reality is very different to that, you know. So that was a huge learning curve for myself, definitely. Um, you know, even things that you don't think of, like you said, like the, the politics, um, you know, I, I found that, yeah, there was a lot of politics came into football um, a lot. And even other just things that, you know, um, nutrition. Um, Malaysians are extremely, extremely passionate about their food. Yeah. Because um, their food is incredible. I get why they are passionate about it because it's some of the most amazing food I've ever had in my life. They've got the best food in the world there, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, and so they are passionate about it. But when you look at that, it's, it's not always the most healthiest of dishes that they that they like. You know, they have nasi lemak, which is basically fried chicken and coconut rice. You know, <laughs> and and you you try and tell a, a, a Malaysian kid that, hey, mate, you can't have your nasi lemak, you, you've got no chance, <laughs> you know. So then you have to even adapt things like that, you know. So it's, it's a huge learning curve. The cultures are very different, and yeah. you've got to get that right. I think that's the most important thing um, in, in any football organisation in anywhere in the world is culture has to be right. You, you've got to embrace that and get the right culture first and foremost, otherwise it's never going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've got to adapt your culture, especially if you're changing country. I suppose being technical director, I mean, when you think about technical director, it's, you think it's all about football, just like putting the programs into place, making sure the coaches have got what they need and driving the, the club forward. But you forget actually this, these other kind of elements that actually have a massive part to play, like the nutrition, like you say, that, that food, then how do you then persuade the club or your players to actually go, well, actually, you know, maybe we need to change this in a way which actually takes them out of what they've done forever and ever um, with also trying to instill to go, by doing this, you will become better or there will be a better chance of you to become a better footballer because it's not just the skills and everything else I can teach you, it's, it's that the surrounding ones. I mean, that must have been very tricky to try and get that on board at the same time. Yeah, yeah, extremely, extremely tricky. Yeah, you know, we was trying all sorts, you know, creating manuals and books and trying to get them sent out, even little posters, um, you know, and I think it was always about adapting it. Uh, you know, we, it was a case of saying, right, you can't not have your nasi lemak. You just can't have it every day for breakfast. Yeah. You know, it's, let's change that. Let's, you can have it after a match day. Let's, let's put it yeah. in if you, you know, you go and play your game on a Saturday. Um, you've worked hard for the week. Go and enjoy that that meal after so it wasn't about because again you try to eradicate it they'd, they'd be an uproar you know like yeah, so it was like yeah. right how can we fit it in but you know give them something a bit more healthy that you are going to still get an improvement yeah you know and then over time obviously that would adapt and change it's like that yeah. was a foundation so yeah um yeah it was tricky trying to get those bits in and yeah. but i think a lot of it was just listening to the people you know um talk to people uh, and talk to people with an open mind yeah. you know keep your mind open talk to them and and get their ideas and just see how you can meet somebody in the middle. Um, I found that that helped a lot. Just get on the ground, talk to the, you know, parents, the players, the staff, just um, talk to people. It'll help you massively. And I suppose like, if you think about um, how far the players or the, the parents of the players want these players to go far in the, in the game, that actually they do need to listen to some of the advice they get. And, and change ways to become better, or even just test it or experiment. You know, like I said, 
use an example of don't eat every breakfast to eat it you know once a week then do it over a period of time does that make a difference do you find you've got more energy do you do you find you're a bit more in tune with stuff do you do you sleep better all that other stuff which i suppose coming into a new club or culture or country that are still learning football and trying to get up the ladder and you and yourself or other people's in the same boat they've got experience from some really massive clubs and understanding and actually yeah coming coming in the middle i suppose it comes down to like how does the player really want to progress and improve themselves and again yeah. not, not just on the on the football field because that can be taught but the other stuff and trying to break or form new habits i suppose yeah. you must have there's some players that embraced it some players kind of did it but maybe didn't follow it whether they told you or not they did and then you've got other players yeah. just couldn't for, for lots of reasons not saying it's bad but they just couldn't do it and i suppose you did you see that kind of band or level of um, oh yeah, massively. There was just such a huge spectrum across the club. You know, you'd you would you'd have like you say one player that would, oh my god, buy into it one hundred percent. I'm doing it. You know, and yeah, you would yeah. see them really go out, and you would see that player just elevate rapidly yeah. um, because they would be in an environment where there's only one or two of them actually fully just no questions asked went straight into it, um, you know, and then you had one or two guys who was just, like you say, some guys were, might have been other reasons why they couldn't do it, and some guys were just, oh, you know, didn't really have that personal drive, you know, they just sort of liked the label of playing at that level, and they didn't really yeah. want to go any anymore, and you, you could see that they fell behind quite fast compared yeah. to the eager guys, and then you got the guys in the middle as well, so, yeah, yeah there was a huge spectrum on that, you know. Yeah. And I suppose not just, so removing the non-football stuff, then going to actually your actual football programs, what you wanted to instill as a philosophy or the, the coaching sessions you put on or coaching the coaching, it probably flowed into those areas as well. And I suppose the question is, as you came into the club, especially as a, a technical director, um, how much change did you really want to install from a football sense? Or did you see something there that was really special and you were just kind of making, as you were working out the culture, I suppose, um, tweaking what you saw from your experience like at what level did you find yourself as you kind of came into that role yeah um i mean it was quite awkward to be honest with you as well um it was quite difficult because i'd gone there as a coach and i'd only and you know i spent a, a year um i say a year probably a bit less than that yeah right. um a bit less than a year being a coach and obviously you come into the club and everyone sees you as a coach mm. and you develop relationships and friendships with these people who they're your peers and then you get this promotion to technical director. That's really difficult going, you know, I think it would have been easier coming from the outside um, to install what I wanted, yeah. you know, because it, people would have gone, well, technical director, let's, we've got to respect this guy straight away. Whereas people's like, oh, you know, you get one or two guys, love it, can't believe you're doing it, mate, this is fantastic. And then you get one or two, like, oh, why is it him and not me? Why are we not following my way, you know? So you'd come into that and that's again, like off the field politics would just massively play a role in it. Um, and there's other things that you do forget because you do go right where, you know, this is this is a philosophy we're getting from essentially, you know, Premier League, European Champions League level clubs. You would think, you know, somebody in Malaysia would go, right, yeah, we're going to listen to every word, get as much information we can off this guy to get to that level. Yes. And you forget that they've got a lot of heritage and culture in their game that, that they love and embrace and they've got their past successes. Yeah. And it was... Um, there was a lot to change on the field, um, very much so, especially in terms of the coaching, um, because you would have guys going, well, this is what we did when Malaysia made it to the Olympics. He was like, but Malaysia made it to the Olympics in the 60s and 70s. This is now a different game. Or, you know, you would you'd get one or two guys, who are you to come and tell me what to do from, from there? And you're like, well... It's, you know, I'm not trying to be rude about it, mate, but this is what I've learned and seen what you're yeah. doing. You know, I can see you were making the same mistakes we made in the UK yeah. years ago, back when I was there, and this is why we changed it. And now look what's happening there, you know. So I'm just giving you that advice. I'm trying to cut, I'm trying to give you a shortcut, you mm. know. Yeah. Um, you can carry on coaching like this for another 10 years mm -hmm. and then go, oh, we need to change. But by then you're now 30, 40 years behind. Whereas, you know, you're coming and giving these people this information saying, look, we could do it now, speed you up, and you're only going to be five years, you know, and then who knows where you can go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of that where, you know, you'd implement these wonderful ideas, you'd walk on the field, and you'd see some of the young guys really having a go at it, really embracing it, and then you'd see some of the older heads, you know. He's only in his 30s. I've been coaching, uh, you know, 
<laughs> longer than he's been wearing underpants, you know, and you just see him revert right back to the other thing. So that became very difficult. Yeah. And I think that's such a common thing, like not just in coaching, but just in life, like, you know, people that work in business or, or anywhere when, when, a, when a younger person or an inexperienced person comes through the ranks into a higher position, there's always that kind of weirdness of embracing and not embracing. Um, and yeah, it's very hard for whether you're a manager, a head coach, a territorial director to actually go, here's what it is, take it or leave it. But you know, we still want you on board with this movement, but actually, yeah, like you said, it's trying to explain to go, I'm not telling you exactly what to do, but here's the context why I'm telling you, because here's my experience and here's what's happening. And um, like the, the game of football is changing so quickly. And it's really interesting. I'll, I'll go on YouTube and watch old football highlights from even 10 years ago, a little bit five years ago, but 10 years plus. Well, certainly if you watched a game in the 70s, it is a completely different game. Yes, you've still got to go and score one more goal than your team to win. But the how... And just the way of how goals are scored and the build-up play, it's like it is like a different game. Um, yeah. And I think it's really interesting where if you come from the the big powerhouse countries like your England, your Spain, or Germany, or Italy, or wherever, that to get those learnings into the other other countries who are really the underdogs. And I suppose it's it's going here's the underdog flavour, and here's some techniques which will help you then gives that a kind of upper hand because then the psychology of actually we can do this and here's some little tips and tricks and we're going to yeah. fight for every ball we can. That's the way to do it. But you're still yeah. going to get some people that actually go, no, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's yeah. fine. Kind of will accept it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, you do. Cause you, it does just, that's how it is, right? Yeah, I think, it, and that's where, again, you know, um, I think selecting as well, like it is, it's the culture and, um, not only that as well, it's selecting on character. Uh, yeah. I believe that's massively, whether it be a, selecting a player, a yeah. coach, like you say, uh, in other businesses, whether you might be an engineer, it's mm -hmm. selecting your team of people you're going to work with is select them based on character, not talent. Um, and, and I think that's a massive, massive thing now. Yeah. Uh, because like you say, you could come into a place where, you know, you've got this coach who, yeah, is very experienced was talented in the past but like you said the game changes so much um and the game is different but they they, they had their success and they, well i did it that way and i i, I won this and yeah. you're like yeah but that was 10 years ago now yeah. and maybe the reason why you're not getting that joy is this but how do you tell someone that politely yeah. when they're so fixated on that and that's where i just think the, the character just becomes so important now because i think we need to recognize somebody who is open-minded adaptable yeah you know, and always willing to learn and change. And when you read books on like Alex Ferguson, that was the biggest thing with him. He was always adaptable. He was always staying up to date with the game and changing and actually leading that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's fine. But again, that's easier said than done. How do you, you know, so it's, it's, it becomes challenging. It really does. It does. Yeah. So you were at uh, Kuala Lumpur for a couple of years, technology director and then what's happened kind of uh since then what, what, what's led you up to where you are now yeah so um i was a uh, yeah like i said it, uh, about a year as a coach in malaysia then became technical director for a couple of years um and then now i've literally i've been working there um two weeks um no sorry longer than that uh i did i came in and did a two-week quarantine in the country and then I started the job and two weeks into the job, the country went into lockdown. So I've actually been working for them about four weeks now right. uh, in total uh, for Huddersfield, uh, yeah. Huddersfield Town and their, their foundation going across yeah. the board. Um, so it's, it's been quite a tricky transition because I landed two week quarantines, two week into the job and then we went into a lockdown. So now it's, um, I've been a couple of weeks working from home again. So um <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, all interesting stuff, but uh, yeah, so I'm actually back home. I'm I'm from Barnsley, which right. is near um, near Huddersfield. It's about a 40, 45 minute drive yeah. into Huddersfield. So I've got that opportunity and I was like, it's a, it's a chance to go back home and be mm. close to family and friends and, mm. and things like that. So uh, I'm now currently working as the football development manager there. Awesome. And hey, look, Huddersfield is a big club. You know, they, they've bounced around with Premiership, champion, mostly a championship big club. But, you know, they're, again, um, punching above their weight sometimes get going up. And I mean, hey, this year's been weird. Next year will probably be weird. And who knows what's next. 
Um, but it must be good to kind of, uh, yeah, like I said, come home for a start because, you know, coming home for the first time in a, in a really good coaching, uh, coaching role in a club, but also, again, bringing in that previous experience that you can then disseminate into the community or into the development stages. Because do you, are you um, concentrating on, on different um, age brackets or is it, is it a, a level a level of skill? That yeah, you're... so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, so, like, the main of my work is, gonna, is, is with the foundation. Yeah. Um, and out in the community. And as I said earlier, I always felt at the start of my journey, I missed out on that community sense by being um, one of the volunteer grassroots Sunday league, Saturday league coaches. Yeah. Um, so like, I'm excited by this now because a lot of this role is just getting out in the community mm. um, and working on those, the programs that they have there. Because Huddersfield have, they've changed their academy structure um, where it's no longer eight right the way through to the first team it's now um starts from under 17s to their academy so they have 17s 19s and then it's like the um, elite development team the elite development squad which is like the reserve squad and then the first team um you know so that's how their structures change so that's where now like working in the um foundation side of the the club uh, becomes massive because that's where we've really got to get an outreach into the community yeah. work with as many grassroots clubs as we can schools colleges um, and create programs that, that people can come into and, and sort of really target the community and then obviously catch those sort of college players later to, to bring them in so wow. um, yeah a lot of my roles basically that now is setting up those sort of programs the development programs pre-academy yeah yeah. Wow. So that is quite, yeah, quite a um, experience to go into, you know, not, yeah, not just yeah, looking at the level of players, you're actually looking at the a whole kind of spectrum up and down, you know, ages and levels. And um, it'll yeah. be interesting to see actually, as, as you go through the building stage and understanding, like, how do you then keep those elite players keep playing for, Huddersfield all the way through, you know, and obviously dotted around the different programs rather than an official academy, um, which yeah. I'm hearing that there's a lot of other clubs are doing a similar thing, which is great because it does open to such a wide audience. And not only you could unearth players that might not have been unearthed in academy because it might be too late for academy, um, but also I suppose even from like a fan base point of view, because the more players that play for Huddersfield at that age, you know, they're probably going to be a Huddersfield fan for life or more or, or less. And so actually open it up to everyone and, and, you know, as much as you can, there's only got to be a good thing for, for that club as well. And then vice versa, yeah. from coaching, you actually get to experience again, a very broad range rather than just going, I'm an academy coach. That means you're at an elite level. Like I said, going back to your roots that never happened, you actually, you're yeah. doing both, which must be a great thing for you to kind of reverse the tide, but, but still progress your career but also yeah. to go back and do that at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, you know, you, you've put it absolutely perfect. And that's why I, I couldn't wait to jump into this role because it was like you say, I felt like I'm progressing my career, mm. but I also felt like I'm getting back what I missed Yeah. In, in my development. So it was like, for me, it was like, oh, I'm getting the best of both worlds. And I never thought this would sort of happen. And the outreach is, it is incredible. You know, um, you're across loads of schools and they've got some great programs and initiatives there. Um, you know, they've got like prim, um, Premier League primary stars, which basically that's where we're coaching in the schools nice. and things. And it's sort of helped and supported and funded by the Premier League from, from when we was in there, right. you know. Uh, and they're going around loads of schools in the Huddersfield region. And we've set up um, a girls' academy um, at um, one of the colleges there at Calderdale College. So um, that only just started. Yeah. And that's, again, trying to springboard the girls from the college team into the academy and into the girls uh, into the women's first team um so yeah you've got this huge out outreach now as you say across the community and there's other little things and what i love about it is because you are on the foundation they've got other sort of programs that they do sort of we've got like a, a health section so um we're involved in a program uh called men's mental health football and it's just uh, a mental health session every wednesday that anyone in in huddersfield can turn up to and Brilliant. come and have a chat come and play a bit of football yeah um you know and then go home just um giving that support to 
you know, people who are maybe struggling with their mental health and things like that. So you get to go and do things like that now as part of the program, which I've always been, you know, massively interested in doing and always wanted to do just sort of, you gain that knowledge and experience as a coach. Yeah. And it's like, you sort of hit that level and then you go, I want to give that back now. And I want to give it back to the people that need it the most. And, and this opportunity is giving me that chance to give it back to the people that, that mm -hmm. need it most. You know, the people who are in the community working at grassroots level, yeah. people who are struggling maybe with the mental health side of things, yeah. you know, so it's, it's brilliant. Uh, what great motivation, self-motivation, like you said, just to get in, get stuck in and just spread out into all those areas. Because, yeah, that mental health and the psychology stuff, I mean, it is it's unwritten stuff that um, we talk about, we kind of know about, but actually do every player or coach get the level that they need? Or actually, even like you said, the community is open up to everyone. So it's just fabulous to hear that Huddersfield have got those kind of things in place, but you're in the thick of things making it happen. Um, and like, it's going to be quite exciting to see as you only just started, you know, forget COVID and hope that disappears at some point that you can carry on and um, just make some really big waves. It's quite exciting to hear. Yeah, that's it. And, and, and it's really exciting because I, obviously they've got a great structure there. They, they've got sort of like a, the, the main management team and then they've got what they call line managers. And I'm, I'm sort of part of that line manager. So it's like, right, I'll look after the football side of things, the football yeah. development. How yeah. are we going to develop the football? How are we going to develop the programs, the, the coaching systems? And then, you know, we'll have people who manage the, the primary stars, for example, that I mentioned earlier. So they'll, they'll go out there and say, right, this is how we're going to run the things in the school and another. So you've got a great support team there. Of, you know, everybody on this level, and right, how are we going to do this? And then you've got the people above. So, yeah, it's really, it's really good. I'm enjoying it. And seeing, like, um, my second week in was uh, uh, basically a, an October holiday camp it was uh, half term October ho holiday half term and it was into a camp and it was great because the local council Kirklees they sponsored over 30 kids who come from more deprived areas to come and join our multi-sports camp because we did a multi-sports camp rather than a football camp so we got out things like you know cricket bats and balls and things like that because it was targeted at sort of the younger age it was range five to eleven year olds yeah and we got tennis rackets out and and it was just brilliant. The, the local news came, um, Look North, they called, and they sort of um, just did a bit of a recording of the kids, interviewed some of the kids, myself, um, our, our CEO kind of thing. Uh, and it was just wonderful because like, even in the interviews of the kids, you know, one, one of them was just, she was amazing. She was like, yeah, I've not got none of this sort of equipment at home. So I've had so much fun, the fact that I've come down and had a chance to sort of play cricket and play with all these different things that I can't do uh, at home. I've learned so much this week. It's been so exciting and fun. And just to see that joy on that kid's face going, wow, like you forget that they've not got access to things like this. And, yeah. you know, this girl's just had the best week of her life because she's actually learned how to use a cricket bat. And yeah. you just sat there going, this is what it's about. You know, this, this is where coaching happens so uh that was just incredible to go and get that in your in your second week in yes. you know we're re really thankful for that yeah you're right that is that's what makes it you know it really does is just seeing enjoyment learning something and you using sport or football for that vehicle you know it's just it's a beautiful thing really and i think yeah we're very privileged to be in those positions or, or put yourself in those positions but yeah I mean, yeah that's it and, and like you say by opening up brilliant like by opening up the way they have we can reach people like that now whereas mm. like you said before when it was full academy only the best yeah. kids got that you yeah. know whereas now everybody's getting a piece of that and, and it's just a wonderful thing i think they're doing yeah hey gareth um we've come to time now like again i think we can talk about this all my night your day like quite easily <laughs> <laughs> yeah it could be here all afternoon quite happily <laughs> quite easily it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you man like i've i've when i looked at your your kind of your linkedin profile and saw all the different things i was like you must have some really cool stories and just like going bouncing around those different areas and then into where you are now i think um it's a fabulous journey and like you said it's still only you, you've only just started you know and i think you're gonna like i said before you're gonna make some massive waves at huddersfield and um, it's quite exciting times there. So thanks so much for your time, mate. It's been really good talking to you. And I'm definitely going to be keen to see how, you're, how you progress in future years and, and see how you do. Uh, bless you. No, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to ask me to come and do this. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And it's, and it's been a pleasure. So thank you very much. And um, again, no, um, more than happy to you know, help you out in any way I can. So if you ever need any help with anything or you, know, you want to do a different type, get in touch and 
if there's any other coaches that want to have a chat with me about anything as well, you know, if someone sees this interview and pops commenting, so I'll be honest, I'm, I'm useless at going back and seeing these sort of things and keeping up to date with the comments. So if there is any coach that, that wants a further conversation, yeah. you know, please put them in touch. If there's any way I can help any other coaches, I'd love to get involved and just help out and have that bit of an outreach. Obviously, you've got this where you're reaching out around the world. So, yeah, I'd absolutely love to help any other coaches that's got any further questions or, you know, a young coach coming in wanting any any help in terms of how can I start yeah. experienced coaches wanting to share ideas I'd love to learn from some experienced coaches that maybe watch this as well to get that more knowledge so yeah if anybody wants to have any learning experiences where we can chat I'd, I'd love to help totally I uh, really yeah appreciate that and I'm sure we will um, I'm sure there's a lot of coaches who watch this just to find out that journey and just want to know more so um, yeah really appreciate and grateful that you could actually uh, offer those services as well so it's a it's a great coaching uh, coaching trait to have to be honest is is just you know teaching and, and sharing knowledge and um, so yeah I think uh, some people will definitely do that that'd be awesome